Welcome, and thank you for standing by. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. All participants will be in a listen-only mode for the duration of the call. During the question and answer session, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. I would now like to turn the call over to Stephanie Shareholtz. You may begin. Thank you. Welcome to our news conference to discuss the agency's progress on the Orion Crew Module, the spacecraft under development to take humans beyond Earth's orbit and on the journey to Mars. My name is Stephanie Shearholtz from NASA's Office of Communications, and I will be moderating today's call. Uh, we will be discussing the key decision point C for the Orion spacecraft, and news release was issued at 12.30 with the primary news for this call for the topic of discussion today. And joining us today to discuss it are NASA's Associate Administrator, Robert Lightfoot, and Bill Gerstenmeier, NASA's Associate Administrator for the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. We'll get started shortly with opening remarks from both. Uh, as was noted, your phones are on mute, and to get into the question queue, you can press star 1 at any time. About one, after, at one hour after the conclusion of the call, you can listen to a replay by dialing toll-free 866-481-6889, and the numeric passcode for that replay is 7897. Again, the toll-free replay number that will be active about an hour after the call concludes is 866-481-6889, and the numeric passcode is 7897. The operator will call on you and open and close your mic so you can ask your question. Please stick to one question and identify to whom it is directed. If we have time, we'll allow reporters to ask a second question. We have about a half an hour for today's call. Mr. Lightfoot and Mr. Grissmeyer both will share some remarks before we take your questions. Mr. Lightfoot, I'll let you get started. Hey, thanks, Stephanie, and thanks to everyone that's uh, tied in this afternoon. Before I jump into the decision that we made for uh, Orion Key Decision Point C, I thought I would just kind of describe the agency process, remind everyone what the process is within inside the agency as we assess our programs and projects. Key Decision Point C, or KDPC is what we refer to it a lot, um, is a, a very critical milestone for all our programs and projects in the agency. Um, it's really comprised of two key areas that we review. We take a look at the technical progress of a program and, a programmatic, and do a programmatic assessment as well. We have a standing review board that provides us an independent assessment to each program or project that's being, that's being reviewed. Um, for the technical, uh, at, at Key Decision Point C, the agency, you know, my board assesses the, the program's successful completion of their preliminary design review, or PDR as, as we call it. And it grants approval to proceed to critical design review, which is what, what you know, is the key kind of point for, for the program from a technical standpoint. For programmatic, the agency, we use KDPC as a place where we set the agency baseline commitment. We confirm the program is going to, you know, be at this, this cost and this schedule um, is, is kind of our, our, to our external stakeholders. And it becomes a basis by which we report back uh, externally. And we do that at what we call a joint confidence level of 70%, joint being the, between the cost and the schedule, what's our confidence level um, as we move forward. Um, it's, it's also for us, this is the commitment that we're held to for breach reporting and things like that that we have to do congressionally mandated on us as we, as we strive to complete these missions. We found 70% um, is kind of a best practice for us, uh, and for the past several years we've used that as a measure in terms of setting this agency baseline commitment. Um, now, while we do that, we routinely uh, have the programs and projects work to internal dates that are a lot more aggressive. Um, I chair this review that the uh, Agency Program Management Council where we have these reviews and I hear from the programs and the standing review board. And then I hear from also the, the rest of the convening authorities, the chiefs of the agency, the, the, the mission directorate that owns the programs and projects, um, and then the other convening authorities there is kind of my um, and, th and then we, we make a decision on what the agency has set as their agency baseline commitment, um, and that's where we head out. And this happens with all our programs and projects. So we do it a lot more in science than we do human exploration programs, but we started moving um, human exploration programs in this direction to try to, to try to set these commitments as we move forward. So that's kind of the agency process that we go through. And, and like I said, Orion was the, the next one in the barrel uh, for that. And we, have, we have them come through, I don't know, two or three quarterly um, with missions that we have in the agency. The, the scope for this review, um, Orion has always been working towards EM2, which is our second mission 
um, second exploration mission that we have in the in the queue. We chose EM2 because that was that was established several years ago, recognizing that EM2 was the first crewed mission and that it would have all the systems on board that we need for an Orion. So it would be a full up Orion. Um, for those of you that follow us closely, you know that the Space Launch System and the Ground Systems, their commitment is for readiness for an EM1. So there, that's a that's the a subtle difference in how we assess that. For Orion, um, we held our review uh, last month in August for EM2. Um, based on the PDR results from last October. And that's really important because this was a while ago. Um, as the chair of, the, of the, the council, I made the decision that I felt like we needed to get EFT-1 behind us, even though these guys had already completed um, PDR. And, and I felt EFT-1 was a good risk reduction activity. Well, obviously, we were using it as a risk reduction activity for us. And the results of that should be factored into what we commit as an agency uh, moving forward. So we held off on having the key decision point until after we got an EFT-1 in and had an opportunity to, to review the, the, the data from that. So for the two parts of the review, for the technical assessment, there are really no issues um, with the great progress the team's been making um, and, and really nothing to stop them from clearing to proceed to, to CDR. And, and we sent them, on, sent them on their way from the technical side of the house. On the programmatic side, one of the requirements we have in our in, in, in the way we do all this uh, uh, from from setting these these decisions setting these these agency baseline commitments is we have to reconcile the difference differences um, in the assessments between the standing review board and the program, and we had a couple of little pretty small differences between between um, the the probability of the risk because what we really do with this 70% joint confidence level is we have a lot of discussion around what risk are we accepting going into this flight, what, you know, where are the areas that are going to potentially bite us as we move forward, whether it's testing, software, all those different things. We have those kind of discussions. And sometimes the Standing Review Board and the program have differences of opinions on where that is. We also spent some time um, discussing the critical path and the risk around the critical path getting to EM2. Um, that they, the team came back in September last week actually um, did a great job brought a great review in standing review board and the program um, and they and they brought in and, and fed us fed us the data we needed um, and we did the did the assessment of that and we set a uh, we, we've now set out set the agency baseline commitment for uh, EM2 or for readiness for EM2 for the Orion program so coming out of the review that was basically set. Uh, to be no later than April of 2023 at a development cost from October 2015 till the time we fly crew for the first time at $6.77 billion. Um, again, this is consistent with the funding levels from the budget, President's budget request. Um, it's also consistent with our established practices, as I described earlier, to make sure we account for, um, at this commitment point, any potential technical risks that may manifest themselves um, in the future and any uncertainties we may have related to, to the budget um, as the budget gets rolled out. Uh, I've also asked the team to continue working toward uh, the original August 2021 date. That's, their, that's where their planning is today. They're planning to that date and working to that date, recognizing that we have much lower confidence in that date. Um, but I saw no reason um, this early in the, the process to change that date as a plan, as a working, I call it the working to date um, for the team, and neither did the standing review board. The standing review board said there's no reason to change it at this point. The, the setting of the commitment for us just encompasses what we believe are historical programmatic risks that we see themselves manifest in, way in different ways. So, so the team's going to continue to work toward the August 2021 date. We will, um, but we're committing that we'll be no later than 2023, uh, April 2023. Um, obviously, we don't we don't stop here. We monitor the progress of the team basically annually, like we're doing with Space Launch System, and we'll, we'll update those those dates uh, as well if we need to. But the team continues to make incredible progress uh, toward, toward that day. It's also important to note that, that we are building a big program here. We're building a multi-decadal uh, human exploration program. And while the individual launches of EM-1 and EM-2 are very important, um, it's also, and, and they are great indicators of, of our progress uh, or how, how we're doing, we've got to balance those individual missions with the overall context of this, this, this exploration journey we're on. So, we take that into account as well, and, and, and again, it is a balance sometimes um, to make sure that we are marching the way we want to go here. So that's that's my opening statement, and, I, and what I'd like to do is just turn it over to uh, Bill Gerstenmeier. I know he's got some comments to share, and he can talk about some of the progress being being made. So, uh, Bill. Thanks, Robert. Uh, again, uh, we had a very thorough review, both technically and programmatically. 
um, as part of the KDPC activity for Orion. Um, I would say technically we're making, the teams are making very, very good progress. Um, you can see the work that's going on down at MAF um, in preparing for EM1 and the systems and the hardware and the work we're doing on EM1 clearly folds into EM2, but a lot of the major elements are down at, uh, in New Orleans uh, beginning welding. Uh, we've completed all the Pathfinder welds except for one, uh, one weld on the Pathfinder system, so we're essentially building a test article down there to make sure that we can get all the welds and everything works right and the fixtures are lined up correct, so that's gone well. There's one more of those welds that need to be done. For the EM1 flight, actually one of the seven welds is complete. That's already already done. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, complete the, uh, the probably the uh, Pathfinder weld and then, then move on to the, the beginning with the EM1 remaining welds to go forward. Uh, almost all the hardware is down at the down at MAF for uh, for uh, welding on EM1, which is a very good sign. Three of the cone panels still have to be delivered. Uh, one's undergoing inspection and then shipping, and they'll be there probably by the end of the year. Um, just a lot of really good activity is moving uh, across the program. The avionics uh, work out in uh, Denver is, is going extremely well. We've got the flight computers in. Some of the power uh, distributed units will be going in out there, and that's looking very, very good. Um, up at Plumbrook, some of the structural components are coming together for the, uh, the service module. Uh, two structural components from the U.S. side as part of that are complete. And then probably towards the end of October, ESA will deliver the structural test article for uh, testing up at Plumbrook. Um, again, software is going uh, very well. There's been uh, a lot of work done on software. We were able to leverage off a lot of the software that flew off of EFT1, and we've made some architecture changes, but we'll embed that architecture or embed that software from EFT1 in the new architecture. So again, tremendous progress there. Um, in terms of the uh, heat shield, the full-scale heat shield engineering uh, development article, it should be done at the end of the month. So. Again, just tremendous work across the program. You know, we're moving out, making very good, solid technical progress as we move towards this date. As Robert said, we'll work to an internal date that'll get the EM2 uh, hardware and vehicle ready to fly uh, much earlier than the, the 2023 date. We're aiming right now for August of 2021. Um, and again, that, that activity looks good. We also looked at the programmatics, and we don't see any major showstoppers with the programmatics. Uh, the cost performance, the contractor performance has been good overall on Orion. So, so again, it looks pretty good from an overall review standpoint. So, again, the program is making a really good, solid progress. EFT1, you know, we delayed this review a little bit to see what we would learn out of EFT1. You know, if you look at EFT1, the flight was almost flawless. Some small, little, minor things that, that needed to be changed, but nothing really big was learned from EFT1. We are making a heat shield change, but as I said, the engineering test article for that heat shield is, is already uh, going to be complete by the end of this month, so that's moving uh, very, very, uh, in a very good pace moving forward. Um, the other things that we saw from EFT1 is that, you know, this vehicle is really an inspiration to a lot of folks around the world. Uh, I get a chance to talk to all our international partners, and they see the progress we're making, they see the work we did with EFT-1, and they know that we're really putting together a capsule that will take uh, humans beyond low Earth orbit and really push human presence into the solar system. So I think our partners are excited about the progress we're making. I think this review that, we, that occurred last month again shows we're on steady track. It also shows the complexity of what we're trying to do. But Again, overall, I think the review was very thorough, and uh, I look forward to your questions as we uh, continue the, the conference today. Thanks. Thank you both. Again, uh, for those reporters on the line, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your phone to get in the queue. The operator will announce you and open and close your mic for you to ask your question. Please stick to one question and identify to whom it is directed. If we have additional time, we'll allow reporters to ask a second question. We'll take the first question. Thank you. Our first question comes from Marsha Dunn from the Associated Press. Your line is open. Twenty twenty one. Um, I know it's for programmatic. 
potential risk, but is that basically money while you're even advertising and no later than 2023? Marsha, we missed the first part of your question. Could you please repeat it? Yes, um, I'm just wondering why um, not just have a commitment date of 2021? What, what are the types of risks that you would see that would push it out to 2023? Yeah, so Marsha, this is Robert. Um, to to kind of just, just some of the things we discussed in the meeting. Um, there's hardware reuse type of uh, activities that are going on during the, during the course of the, the project where we felt it was better from an overall commitment standpoint. Well, we don't anticipate a problem there. We've seen problems like that in the past. And so we're, the, the kind of green light schedule is that there won't be any problems using a piece of hardware from one test to the next. Um, there's the structural test articles that, could, that have historically taken us longer to get through than, than we've seen. Um, software development, you know, in our, in our model, you got to realize this is a model that we run based on, you know, all these previous programs. Software development typically takes longer than planned. Um, but right now, again, we're not seeing any issues in those areas, but we have to account for those because we've got a lot of runway in front of us here before we, before we get there and those things could pop. So I think that those are three of them that I remember we had a pretty, a pretty large amount of discussion around uh, during the review. And then the other piece is, is you know, the European service module and how we, how we come in. Um, we, we've got the first one coming in for EM1 and this second one that, that we've got to make sure what, what we learn from EM1 will actually feed it what happens with, with, with EM2 obviously. So those are, those are some of the risks that are out there. Um, and, and basically each time these guys hit a milestone in, in their testing or their production, they either retire risk or we, we actually realize a risk and that's kind of how we, how we do it with them all. Does that help? Yes, yes, it does. And, and is, um, are you keeping the 2018 target date for EM1? Yes. That stays the same. The readiness for all three systems. We still have to go through the process of uh, um, when the critical design reviews are done at the end of this year, we said we would get everybody together at the end of the critical design reviews and assess what the actual date is for the three integrated programs. But all, there's nothing right now that gives us any indication different than the fall of 18 for everybody being ready, and we'll set a launch date on CDRs. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take the next question. Our next question comes from Bill Harwood from CBS News. Your line is open. Thanks a lot. Um, for either of you, really, I guess I'm, it's kind of a follow-up on Marsha's question. I'm, I'm, EFT1, as, as Bill said, was an almost flawless mission. I'm trying to understand maybe what the two or three major things were that have changed or have forced you into, uh, maybe forced is not the right word, but have, have, have pushed this out to no later than versus no earlier than. I'm just I'm trying to understand what you've learned that has given you less confidence. Something specific. Thanks. Uh, this is Kirsten Meyer. I started and maybe Robert can add some things. I, I would say one thing we did is uh, we did some uh, changes to reduce weight. We, you know, we took a lot of weight out of the structure for uh, EM1 and EM2, you know, roughly 500 pounds or so. And we also reduced the number of pan cone panels that make up the cone section of Orion. We did that because we thought it would save weight, and it also we thought it would save production time. It turned out that in manufacturing those panels, since they're now um, 120 degrees instead of the, the smaller number of degrees of, of more panels, they tend to uh, to unbend. You know, they're shaped into a um, into a, uh, a radius, and when we machine the material out to make them lighter, they tend to want to go back to a flat sheet. And we didn't recognize that that would be a problem. So we're going to have to change, or, or the teams have actually changed already, some of the manufacturing techniques of these panels. So that's kind of an unknown unknown that, that popped up. It's a small change. And I think we're being, you know, somewhat conservative. You know, my teams will tell you that they're trying to work every uh, risk that's out there, every risk that the SRB has identified, we, the standing review board has identified. We think we can handle those risks. But as, if you look at the complexity of what we're doing and building this that show up and to protect for those, we went with the, with the later date, the 2023. And then I'll see if Robert wants to add anything. Yeah, I, the only thing I was going to say, Bill, is that we, we, have, we, we do have a fairly conservative approach, and it's really a model-based uh, set of experiences that we have from previous programs. We've been trying to capture this for several years now so that when we have these discussions, we don't miss something. You know, and it's generic across all our programs and projects. Um, the only other specific thing that we really had a lot of discussion around was 
when you look, we, we've made some we've made some decisions around the integrated test lab out, out in Denver, and that's that's a potential challenge for us. We haven't run as much through that that process yet um, as we had to do for EFT one, and so we realize that's a it could be a place where we've got a low an overload that we got to go work through. Um, the advantage to doing it now, though, and, and what's what's good about it is, as, as Bill said, is we've identified these pretty early, and these guys are attacking them. Um, they're kind of knocking them down as quick as they can, but we know there's going to be some unknown unknowns that pop up. That's just the history of just about every program. Thanks. Thank you. We'll take the next question. Our next question comes from Irene um, Klotz from Reuters. Your line is open. Thanks very much. Um, I think this question is probably for Bill. Um, what was the confidence level for the, uh, for the August 2021 date? And um, uh, I have a follow-up if that's okay. I don't think we calculated a specific uh, confidence level for 2021. Robert can help me. Yeah, yeah we, did, we didn't do that from that standpoint. Uh, because there was way too many variables on that, we just what we said was we know that's the team is working to that plan right now. It's it's not a very high confidence level, I'll tell you that, just because of the his, the things we see historically pop up. Um, but there was really no reason to move it. And and, and again, the agency policy is 70%. So we just went with the we decided we need to stick with the agency policy for what we're committing to. Okay, generally, when you came, it was like less than half that, or can you characterize? Um, can you characterize that? And then I had a question about the $6.77 billion for development costs that basically the clock starting um, October 2015, does that budget carry you all the way through EM2 or do you transition at some point into an operational budget that is outside of the numbers that this review encompassed? So okay, so the budget piece, Gers, do you want to you want to handle that one? Because I think that gets us to EM two, but there's other things that were. Yeah, yeah, that takes us to the budget that that's described here takes us to EM two, and it it doesn't include them any uh, EM three or other other hardware budget numbers. So it's just specific to EM two. And then going back to the to the other the confidence for the um, August twenty one date. Again, we, we have discrete schedules that show we can make that date with some number of months margin. What we didn't do is we didn't run the math model because you'd have to build a unique math model for the uh, for essentially the build schedule we have to 2021. So we didn't go through all that. So we can't really speculate on what a JCL number is for that for that 21 day. Right, thanks. Thank you. We'll take the next question. This question comes from Greg Redfern from WTOP News. Your line is open. Thank you for taking my question. Gentlemen, I just have uh, one question here. Uh, you speak a lot of the unknown factor as far as the schedule goes. Is there something that uh, you're focusing in on as being the most critical milestone that has to be met for EM1, EM2? In other words, is there anything that's really keeping you guys up at night that you'd like to share? And thank you, and go Orion. First, you want to hit that first? I can. Yeah, I, yeah, I can. I'll hit a little bit. First of all, you know, I don't think we stay up at night. We just work hard. Uh, <laughs> but, but there's a there's a lot of uh, manufacturing. If if you can maybe get from the program, can send you some pictures of a lot of the aluminum structure that comes together to make up this capsule. And if you look at it just from a a manufacturing standpoint, we've filled up many of the uh, large aluminum manufacturers throughout the United States that are building parts. And so between what we're doing for SLS and what we're doing for Orion, we've taken a lot of activity in, in aluminum manufacturing and uh, materials manufacturing, and we've really filled up their processes uh, with what we're doing. So we could run into a snag where we just can't get more work done through a fabric uh, fabrication shop, or we could run into where we're trying to order parts and we can't get parts just because we've filled up uh, all the parts for various pieces. So. I think it's a it's complex from an assembly standpoint. It's also a complex from an ordering standpoint. It's a very very integrated vehicle, and those are the kind of unknowns that, that we talk about that can show up. So you know, all of a sudden something can happen. A, an aluminum sheet cannot get manufactured correctly. You can have a problem with the shipment where a truck uh, 
has a problem on the road delivering or you have a high acceleration into avionics parts that are being shipped someplace and all those cause you problems. And, and those are the kind of things that we, we're trying to protect for. They're in those models that we talk about when we go out to that 2023 date. And those are the kind of things we're protecting for. But we're trying to build margin wherever we can and where the teams can get ahead, they'll work ahead. And, and Orion is a pretty exciting vehicle and, and you ought to get a chance to take a look at the hardware, the avionics and software and the people that work on it. It's a very, very impressive program. And for Greg, for me, it's the, it's the testing. We, when we're The next couple of years, we're going to be getting into a lot of testing on the systems. And that's really where we learn. That's where the hardware talks to us and tells us what's going on. And it's very similar to what Gers said about the panels. You know, we start taking weight out, and all of a sudden they want to flatten out. We learned, and that's something we learned in this process. And we didn't plan on having to learn that, but we learned it, and we're moving on, and the team's, team's pressing. But with the amount of testing we've got and then the coordination of that testing, can we, can we, or the, the efficiency around that testing, getting it done once instead of doing it once and then having to come back and doing it again, you know, that, that's a, those, those kind of, uh, that, that kind of planning activity. The team has a good plan, but there's there's you know always that chance of a of a hiccup uh, and things that we learn because we want to learn too. That's what that's the reason that we do the testing. So that's that's my that's my one thing. Thank you. We'll take the next question. Thank you. Our next question comes from Frank Mooring from Aviation Week. Your line is open. Thank you, um, Robert. I think you mentioned um, one of the issues that that came up was reuse of elements in as the development program goes forward and i seem to recall that that early on lockheed martin said that they were actually going to refly or at least retest some of the elements maybe use them in drop tests could you walk us through um a little bit in a little bit more detail what those elements are that were initially done to save money and if they're going to be if you're going to have to build new elements or just what exactly you have to do to get comfortable with with that part of it and also, could someone please tell me what the cost of Orion was up to the um, the start date on the 6.77 billion, um, which I think was August of, of this year? October. Yeah, October. October thank you. I think it was um, 4.7 billion, Frank, for that one. To answer the second half of your question. Um, the, and the go ahead, Bill. It, I, I can help you on the first one. One of the major things is we're going to take all the avionics boxes that fly on EM-1 and with the intent right now is to refly those boxes on uh, EM-2. So that the concern is that if you have any kind of problem with the box on EM-1 and it's not available for EM-2, um, you could run into a problem where that impacts um, the, the build of uh, EM-2. So that, that's one area of, of reuse that we're concerned about. Um, you know, it's pretty straightforward. We're looking to see if maybe we could advance some avionics box purchases. Um, I think right now we have an entire uh, ship set gets reused. Maybe we only reuse a portion of that. So we'll try to mitigate some of those risks. But that's one example of a reuse item. Yeah, and, and Frank, the other one that, that goes in the other direction where the program actually made a decision to build some extra hardware is the launch support system area. We were planning on reusing, and we said, you know, the, the, the risk associated with that, mainly from a schedule perspective, just didn't make sense. So so Mark Geyer and the team made the decision to, to go ahead and purchase another, another bit of hardware. So that's, those are two good examples. We'll take the next question. Thank you. The next question comes from Jeff South from Space News. Your line is open. Yeah, I'm wondering how much the uh, schedule estimate is dependent on uh, budget. If you get more money for Orion, as Congress has been wanting to do in recent years, does that uh, accelerate your schedule from April 2023 towards 2021? I think there's one of the one of the factors in the model, Jeff, is absolutely budget. Um, as we look at that, it's a it's a it's a piece or percentage of that model as we go forward. So, the certainty or the amount of budget we get in any given year definitely does that. Now, it's also a timing thing. It's when you get it. I mean, I, I can't get it all at the last year and expect to, you know, have a, have, be able to work that. So, so depending on when it, when, what budget certainty, we, what we did is we chose to use the President's budget request and that's the, the that's the most certain we have um, and the run out of that throughout the years. Thank you. We'll take the next question. Thank you. Our next question comes from Eric Berger from the Houston Chronicle. Your line is open. Hello. Thank you very much for doing this. Uh, I guess this is a question for Gersh. Um, 
Now I realize you're, you know, you're probably at least half a decade away from, you know, deciding on specifics for human Mars missions, but that's kind of what, you know, Ryan has talked about as, as the vehicle or a vehicle in that, in that mission. Could you talk a little bit about where Orion would lie on a critical path in terms of the, uh, an eventual human mission to Mars? Is it something astronauts would ride in for potentially on the way there, or would it be waiting for them when they get back? I mean, is this a piece that you need essentially to get back to the surface of the Earth from Earth orbit or from the moon? Talk about that, please. Yeah, clearly on the, the Mars class missions, Orion is a, is a key player. You know, we've designed the heat shield to, to return at essentially lunar velocities, and we demonstrated 80% of that on EFT-1. So it is it's clearly the, the capsule that the crews will return to Earth on from exploration class missions. I think the first real critical role that Orion starts playing is when we go to the proving ground of space, and, and we kind of define the proving ground of space as a region around the moon where we can get back in several days if something goes wrong. And what we need to do is we need to take, you know, all the skills that we've learned in low Earth orbit where, you know, we're, we're pretty comfortable working on the space station every day. We have crews up there uh, for the last 15 years. But if something goes wrong on station, you can be home in a matter of hours. And, and we need to now start stretching our, our ability to be comfortable in space and, space and operate and have procedures and hardware and techniques where we can now be you know, several days away before we can get back to the Earth. And, and the moon is a great place to do that. And Orion is a very capable vehicle to help with that proving ground kind of missions. You know, Orion's unique in the fact that it's not just a capsule. It has some habitation capability and it can support you know, for crew for up to 21 days. And what that gives us is an ability to actually use the capsule without any other hardware around the moon to do some precursor, or we call them proving ground, or learning activities around the moon. So I think Orion's first role will be really to be that tool that will help us go push human presence beyond low Earth orbit and let us learn the skills, techniques, test hardware in the, the proving ground of space around the moon that will actually prepare us then to go to the Earth independent region or to start moving out towards Mars. So, so Orion is a predominant first key player in really allowing us to move human presence out of low Earth orbit. So I, I think it has a very, very bright future for us as we move forward in this space. Thank you. We'll take the next question. Thank you. Our next question comes from James Dean from the Florida Today. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Grismar, could you Please recap what you expect the EMT mission to be, and uh, you know what the crew will, how many crew, what it will do, where they'll go, and um, regarding the readiness state, how vulnerable is it to, to moving back if EM1 slips, or conversely, I was wondering if you know with, with these uh, pardon me, um, confidence levels uh, in the past. I think they project further out to say, you know, maybe by, you know, June, July, August or whatever, you might step up to 90% confidence. You know, can you give us a sense, you know, uh, how that confidence level improves over time past that, that April time frame? Okay. Um, well, we'll kind of start with maybe your first question. You know, if EM1 slips, um, it doesn't necessarily impact EM2. Um, and we need to be very careful that, you know, Robert described this very well in his opening remarks that this is, we're not really flying two missions. We're really building a capability that, that moves us beyond low Earth orbit as I described in my earlier discussion. And what we've got to do is we've got to be careful that if we, you know, if we just wanted to launch EM-1 by some date, we could move test requirements off of EM-1 and then move them later into portions of EM-2 and maybe downscope EM-2. And that's not what we want to go do. We want to make sure that we get all the right testing done on EM1 that we can actually move forward with EM2. So, so to get some of that testing done on EM1, you could actually envision a case where you might slip EM1 a little bit, but that by slipping EM1 a little bit, that actually ensures that EM2 will be on time because that testing doesn't have to be done on the ground. Those test objectives can be done in space on EM1. So it's kind of a not straightforward, but it's a very integrated schedule, kind of between EM1 and EM2, but there's not a one-to-one -one tie. If EM1 slips, it doesn't necessarily mean EM2 moves. Then to your other question about the kind of things we'll do, be doing with EM2, the, the big thing with crew is we want to go look at the, you know, we'll use EM1 to check out the service module to make sure we can do the burns in and out of um, a distant retrograde orbit around the moon. 
We'll make sure that the communication systems work. We'll make sure the navigation stuff works. We'll make sure all the software works. But then comes EM2, and the big thing there are the crew interfaces. You know, how does the crew interact with the vehicle? What are the displays and controls like? What do they do during entry configuration? Those things. So there'll be a lot of testing done on EM2 to check out the vehicle and how it interacts with the human. The other big thing with EM2 is we get the life support system. So we'll have the, the oxygen uh, supplies available. We'll have CO2 removal capability. Um, we'll have humidity control, temperature control. All those things will get checked out and, and rung out on EM2. So again, I think what EM2 stresses is EM2 really makes sure that the vehicle is, is ready to interact with the crew and is ready to go do the crew. And then after that, then we get on with more objective tests like EM3 where we'll do uh, maybe an automated rendezvous kind of things. We'll do some precision uh, uh, checkout. We'll do some stuff on the far side of the moon where we don't lose calm with the Orion to look at more autonomous crew operations. We'll get a chance to see some, some pieces there. So, so the way it flows is the first EM1, you kind of check out the vehicle, make sure that the vehicle really performs. It's a solid vehicle. EM2, you check out the vehicle again, you reconfirm what you learned on EM1, you bring in the interaction with the crew, you make sure the crew interactions with the vehicle are really ready to go. And then by EM3, you're really ready to go use a ride and start pushing those proving ground objectives and doing the training that gets you into deep space. Thank you. We'll take the next question. Yes, our next question comes from Jason Davis from the Planetary Society. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, my question kind of follows on your last um, comment. Uh, I was going to ask what, uh, how the objectives of EM2 might change if you're forced to move it uh, two years to the right on the schedule. Um, would there be a possibility of combining it with the asteroid redirect mission if that goes forward, or is that uh, off the table at this point for EM2? Thanks. Again, it depends how testing goes on the ground and how progress occurs. You think of this as a test program where you want to you want to test as much as you can, but you don't want to test too much. That you've really you know you've stressed the system or you push too hard. So that's the balance of of what's the right level of testing, and and have you gained enough confidence in the vehicle that you can really use it operationally, and you don't have to worry about the vehicle operating. You know the vehicle's going to operate. You know its systems are going to work. And then you're ready to do the challenges of the mission. So I think you would likely not do the asteroid redirect mission on that first Orion crew flight just because of the complexity of the two activities. Um, but it depends really what happens on the EM2. If we really have high confidence in the vehicle and we don't think there will be any, any concerns, you could, could, you could potentially attempt to go to the asteroid redirect mission and then, then stop at some point if, if something doesn't work out right. But I think in general you would really like to get the vehicle fully checked out and, and spend some time doing some unique things with the vehicle to make sure the crew interactions with the vehicle really work the way you intended, make sure the software is really debugged, you really understand how the vehicle operates. So then when you go to that, that kind of operational mission like the asteroid redirect mission where your focus now is to go do an EVA and depress the Orion capsule and go out and grab a sample off the asteroid, to make sure that you can really focus on all those first, you know, depressing the capsule, doing the EVA, grabbing the sample. So, so to avoid making the mission overly complex, you want to get the vehicle checked out, you want to understand how it operates, and then you can put it in this more stressful environment. And if you think about that, that's really the same strategy we're using with the Mars class mission, is we want to use the vicinity around the moon as really the place to to really ring out our systems and understand how our hardware operates and how our crews can be more autonomous so they're ready to go to take that next step. Thank you. We'll take the next question. Yes, our next question comes from Elizabeth Howell from Discovery News. Your line is open. Hello, I was curious about how astronaut selection would change given the, uh, the higher G loads and the, uh, the smaller uh, physical constraints in terms of space for the astronauts on the Orion when the time comes. Thank you. George, do you want to hit that? Yeah. yeah, I don't really know that there's dramatic changes. The G loads are higher, but I don't think it's changed any of our physical considerations. And, and I don't know the answer about the astronaut size and uh, 
makeup. So maybe we can, maybe Stephanie can get back to you with an answer on, on those specifics and see if there's been any changes. I don't think there are any, but, but Stephanie can, can get with the right technical folks and, and answer your question. We'll get back to you on that, Elizabeth. And we'll take the last question. Thank you. Our last question comes from Ken Kremer from Universe Today. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking my question and for doing this. Um, actually, my question is about the uh, asteroid redirect mission. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what is the latest uh, thinking about what that mission will entail, what is the timing. And you know, some serious people have thought about uh, sending the, the unmanned probe to Phobos and then bringing a, a, a sample back from there. What's your thinking about that? Thank you. Maybe I'll let Robert start and then I'll, I'll, I'll finish. Yeah, I think, um, you know, for us, we, we're continuing to press in toward what we said before. It's it clearly um, we're waiting to see what the 16 budget looks like and what the final outcome on, on the deliberations on the budget. The teams are making great progress. We've got a capture mechanism delivered to Goddard from the folks at Langley. They're putting it in with the robotics team out there and starting to starting to fit that 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 piece of the activity together. We continue to make great progress in the solar electric propulsion world. Um, the, the team at Glenn and the team at Jet, Jet Propulsion Lab are, are knocking those, those are working on the, reducing the risk associated with that, especially in the um, power production power, power unit associated with that. Um, we still think that's a good demonstration mission for us to, to demonstrate a lot of the capability that we're going to. The the baseline is still to to take a, a, a boulder off of a larger aster off, off a larger asteroid and bring it back into the this lunar space for all the reasons that Bill described it's a great operational mission for us to to start doing interaction in, a, in an area different than low earth orbit so um, you know the future could be I mean there's the, the future missions could could actually go more clearly we want to go to the, the Mars vicinity at some point and we're still looking at that but the main thing is we have to demonstrate the technology now and then we'll see what we can use it for in the future. First, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think Robert covered it pretty well. There's there's been a lot of work done on electric propulsion. There's some RFPs have been back. We've got responses, and, and we're currently in blackout on those. But that's been a very very productive activity, and that's moving forward. Um, as Robert said, we'll get the details through the budget activity and see how that that comes out for the asteroid redirect mission. Mm -hmm. The, the robotic activities, the arms, and some of the capture devices, the teams have made really tremendous progress on, on that activity. So again, you know, things are, are moving pretty well. We'll just continue to keep moving, and then the mission, you know, seems seems pretty good. We'll just see how the budget uh, activities uh, shake out here in the next uh, next year or so. Okay, um, we will take one more question, and then any closing remarks from Mr. Lightfoot and Mr. Gerstenmeier. Thank you. Um, the, the last question is from Mike Wall from Space.com. Your line is open. Yes, hi, guys. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for doing this. Um, just a quick question, kind of following on what, what the last caller asked. Um, yeah, it's a little early to think about timing for the EM3, but I mean, if, if the EM2 does get pushed back to 2023, I mean, how would that impact what the next flight would be, EM3? Would that push that back another I don't know, two years or so, or could it could it come closely on the heels of, of EM2? I mean, what are you guys thinking about that in terms of timing? Yeah, again, the, the way I think Robert described it very good at the beginning, and maybe you can add some more, is, you know, we're really trying to build a, a program where we can build hardware ahead. So depending on what gets, you know, causes the schedule slip on EM2, if we can still make progress on EM3 and, and start uh, buying some hardware and, and keep it moving forward, we would do that. So again, I think you're not going to see uh, you know, a slip caused by EM3 to where EM2 is. You know, ultimately, we'd like to get where we're flying these exploration missions about once per year. You know, we're still working through the budget process to find all the funding and to get production and operations costs down to where we can fly roughly once a year. But we want to we want to fly these missions, you know, after EM2, roughly on about one year centers. So we're putting together plans and processes. You know, the things we talked about even on Orion, where we we changed some of the manufacturing to reduce the number of welds. You know, that was done to really help with production, so we could manufacture the capsule a little bit faster. Um, some of the pathfinder work we're doing, we're finding out that maybe we don't need to do that pathfinder work every time and we can actually reduce production schedules for that. 
Um, the other thing is we made the heat shield change to go to the block heat shield from the uh, Avcoat uh, monolithic heat shield. Uh, again, I, I told you that the engineering article was going to be ready maybe by the end of uh, October, which is which is pretty quick. And what that says is we potentially got a better manufacturing for that heat shield. So all these things are aimed at at building a producible system that's affordable that we can fly on roughly a one-year center. So. I wouldn't get too worried about these schedules. If we do our homework right and we take our time going through the developmental process and we understand how to improve production and we don't focus on just this mission EM2, but we also make the changes that put the right production uh, systems in place, the right supply lines in place, we can get to where we can have a very functional capability that's affordable and we continue to fly these exploration missions that will ultimately get, get us ready to go to Mars. And I think that the only thing I would add is, is I think, you know, it, once we get the capability in place of being able to launch Orion um, on a routine basis, there are, there are numerous things we need to do to get ready to go to Mars, as Gersh said. And I kind of look at it as, as today, we'll, we'll change the manifest of a cargo supply mission to station just based on what we need or what's the next, you know, the next thing on the list. I, I fully expect as we go forward that the EMs will fall in that capability, in that same kind of arrangement. What technology is ready to be demonstrated? What needs to be demonstrated? Um, what can the crew do from an operational perspective that we learned from the last mission? And they'll build on each other to get us ready to go. And I think, um, there, there, trust me, there's plenty, plenty on our plate to, to use those EM missions for, and we just, we just have to prioritize those as we move forward. Thank you. That will conclude the questions. Um, any closing remarks, Mr. Lightfoot? Gerst, is Alfred Gerst, anything from you, Gerst? No, I don't have anything else to add. Again, I want to thank all the reporters for the interest today, and I think that this is a pretty exciting time in human spaceflight. We are probably, there's more development going on in, in the human spaceflight arena, especially in my directorate, than ever occurred in a long time in the history of the agency. And it's it's exciting to in all the development. It's not, uh, it's different than operations, but it's it's just every bit as exciting. And what's exciting about it is you can kind of fast forward a little bit. And with my operations background, I can see the future of how we can really use this hardware in pretty amazing ways. And and we're really again showing leadership by moving forward with both SLS and Orion, and and really moving activities forward. The work we're doing with commercial crew, and I think this is the one year anniversary of the selection of the commercial crew providers. That's an exciting capability. What's happening on space station with the one year expedition is also pretty amazing. So I think if you step back and you look at this period, this is a pretty pivotal time as we're really poisoned, putting the United States in a place to really continue to, to push human presence out the solar system. And again, we'll do that leveraging off of a the private sector and leveraging off the international partners wherever we can. So again, thanks for your time today. Robert? Can't add anything to that, Gersh, that was well said. So thank, thanks to everybody for being on today. Thank you all for joining us today to discuss the progress on NASA's Orion Crew Module. You will be able to listen to a replay of this tele teleconference in about an hour by dialing toll-free 866-481-6889. The passcode is 7897. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Thank you for your participation in today's conference. All participants may disconnect at this time. One at any time. About one, after, at one hour after the conclusion of the call, you can listen to a replay by dialing toll-free 866-481-6889. And the numeric passcode for that replay is 7897. Again, the toll-free replay number that will be active about an hour after the call concludes is 866-481-6889. And the numeric passcode is 7897. The operator will call on you and open and close your mic so you can ask your question. Please stick to one question and identify to whom it is directed. If we have time, we'll allow reporters to ask a second question. We have about a half an hour for today's call. Mr. Lightfoot and Mr. Grismeyer both will share some remarks before we take your questions. Mr. Lightfoot, I'll let you get started. Hey, thanks, Stephanie, and thanks to everyone that's uh, tied in this afternoon. Before I jump into the decision that we made for uh, Orion Key Decision Point C, I thought I would just kind of describe the agency process, remind everyone what the process is within this direction to try to, to try to set these commitments as we move forward. So that's kind of the agency process 
that we go through. And then, like I said, Orion was the, the next one in the barrel uh, for that. And we have we have them come through, I don't know, two or three quarterly um, with missions that we have in the agency. The, the scope for this review, um, Orion has always been working towards EM2, which is our second mission, um, second exploration mission that we have in the in the queue. We chose EM2 because that was that, that was established several years ago, recognizing that EM2 was the first crewed mission and that it would have all the systems on board that we need for an Orion. So it would be a full up Orion. Um, for those of you that follow us closely, you know that the Space Launch System and the Ground Systems, their commitment is for readiness for an EM1. So there, that's a that's the a subtle difference in how we assess that. For Orion, um, we held our review uh, last month in August for EM2 um, based on the PDR results from last October. And that's really important because this was a while ago. Um, as the chair of the, of the, the council, I made the decision that I felt like we needed to get EFT-1 behind us, even though these inside the agencies we assess our programs and projects. Key decision point C, or KDPC is what we refer to it a lot, um, is a very critical milestone for all our programs and projects in the agency. Um, it's really comprised of two key areas that we review. We take a look at the technical progress of a program and, a programmatic, and do a programmatic assessment as well. We have a standing review board that provides us an independent assessment to each program or project that's being, that's being reviewed. Um, for the technical, uh, at, at Key Decision Point C, the agency, you know, my board assesses the, the program's successful completion of their preliminary design review, or PDR as, as we call it. And it grants approval to proceed to critical design review, which is what, what is the key kind of point for, for the program from a technical standpoint. For programmatic, the agency, we use KDPC as a place where we set the agency baseline commitment. We confirm the program is going to, you know, be at this, this cost and this schedule um, is, is kind of our, our, to our external stakeholders. And it becomes a basis by which we report back uh, externally. And we do that at what we call a joint confidence level of 70%, joint being the, between the cost and the schedule, what's our confidence level um, as we move forward. Um, it's, it's also for us, this is the commitment that we're held to for breach reporting and things like that that we have to do professionally mandated on us as we, as we strive to complete these missions. We found 70% um, is kind of a best practice for us. Uh, and for the past several years, we've used that as a measure in terms of setting this agency baseline commitment. Um, now, while we do that, we routinely uh, have the programs and projects work to internal dates that are a lot more aggressive. Um, I chair this review that the, the Agency Program Management Council where we have these reviews and I hear from the programs and the standing review board. And then I hear from also the, the rest of the convening authorities, the chiefs of the agency, the, the, the mission directorate that owns the programs and projects, um, and then the other convening authorities there is kind of my um, and, th and then we, we make a decision on what the agency has set as their agency baseline commitment, um, and that's where we head out. And this happens with all our programs and projects. So we do it a lot more in science than we do human exploration programs, but we started moving um, human exploration programs in this direction. Welcome, and thank you for standing by. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. All participants will be in a listen-only mode for the duration of the call. During the question and answer session, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. I would now like to turn the call over to Stephanie Shareholtz. You may begin. Thank you. Welcome to our news conference to discuss the agency's progress on the Orion Crew Module, the spacecraft under development to take humans beyond Earth orbit and on the journey to Mars. My name is Stephanie Shearholtz from NASA's Office of Communications, and I will be moderating today's call. Uh, we will be discussing the key decision point C for the Orion spacecraft and news release was issued at 12.30 with the primary news for this call for the topic of discussion today. And joining us today to discuss it are NASA's Associate Administrator Robert Lightfoot and Bill Gerstenmeier, NASA's Associate Administrator for the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. We'll get started shortly with opening remarks from both. Uh, as was noted, your phones are on mute, and to get into the question queue, you can press star.